Welcome everybody. Tonight we're going to talk about vertebrae pest management. So as you can see, it's guess who's coming to dinner up in the right hand corner and, and usually you get the deer coming in more often than we want to around here. So we're going to cover a lot of topics tonight. This, this slide shows pretty big and there's a lot of information but it's a lot of stuff that is online and I give you the hyperlinks so you can connect right to it. But these are the topics we're going to cover the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife site, the moles, the gophers, the voles, the squirrels, rabbits, rodents, raccoons, possums, skunks, nutria, beavers, deer, elk, bats, birds, dogs, cats, and then the hardest to take care of of all of them. So we'll start on the presentation. Here we go. Okay, vertebrae. They are basically anything that has a backbone. And a pest is going to be something that causes aesthetic damages or economic damages. And basically, anything that destroys your garden is considered a pest. Anything that eats your, your um, landscape plants, uh, destroys your yard, those are considered pests. Pests can be controlled by removing, trapping, or eliminating by lethal means. So hopefully we're going to show you different ways as we go through each of these different pests on how to control them and how to, basically how to live with them. Before we start going into anything, the introduction basically is what we're going to talk about is the type of animal we're, ta we're dealing with, then the benefit of the animal versus the cost of the damage the animal's causing. And then there's always the legalities in the state of Washington, which we have to really watch out for. The main site that is best to use is this WDFW, which is Washington Department Fish and Wildlife web pages. If you go to these, all the hyperlinks are listed right there. And those will tell you about every one of these pests that we're talking about tonight. So we're going to show you how to use the pages first. So if you click on that, this is going to be basically the home page. This changes usually about every day, so you're not necessarily going to see the black bear there, but you will see something of this sort, and then you see the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. If you click on the species and the habitats, that's going to take you to another page. That's going to bring you here. And then if you go down towards the middle, it says living with wildlife. And we click on that, it's going to bring you to the next page. And then you're going to get into the species or the species fact sheets. That's going to bring you to the mammals, birds, and reptiles, and amphibious pages and you click on whichever one you're dealing with. Tonight we're going to deal with mammals. That's going to give you a list of mammals and you just click on those and that's going to bring you to all the legalities, how to deal with all the different types of mammals and what to do about them. So Gary, if you want to show that first poll, that'd be great. Okay, what is the best way to control moles? Moles is going to be the first one we're talking about. And there's two answers that you can pick on this that will be answered correctly. So all you want to do is just click on the two you think it is and then submit. And we're not going to know who's voting on what, but it just gives us a tally of what you think. So go ahead and click and then submit it. Four people, five people, six people, seven people. Okay. And 
Everybody can see that, I'm assuming. All right. Yeah, they said here the best is uh, leave alone. And trapping is, well, trapping is the best and leaving alone was the second one. Those are the correct two answers. And those two work the best. So moles, we're going to talk moles. Moles are the, uh, they make the, the yard a mess. However, if you can deal with the moles, and if the mole, the, the mole mounds don't bother you, leave them alone because they're doing great work for your yard. They're aerating. They're making the soil more workable. They're doing great jobs for the property. However, a lot of people can't stand the mole mounds in the yard, and they want to get rid of them. So it, this is basically, this slide here just tells you what they are. Moles are just insectivores. They like to eat grubs, earthworms, and soil. Another nice thing about them, they always live fully underground. But if you look down below, about halfway down there, you see that they're a digging machine. And this, this took a little bit to find out these facts, but a mole will dig 18 feet per hour. And then also, if it's in a pre-dug hole, they can dig 80 feet per minute. So they can cover a lot of distance in a short period of time. So that's just amazing what they do to your property. And as we did some more looking on moles, we found out, I looked up and found the breeding time frames for them and then their lifespans, four to six years. There's three separate types of moles in the state of Washington. The shrew mole, which is found along the stream banks, and it's going to give you a little description about each of those. And there's what one looks like. The Pacific Coast Mole, which is a little bit bigger. And it looks like that. And then here's the last one. And the Townsend, the Townsend Mole is the one we see the most. And this is a typical mole tunnel. You'll see the permanent tunnel underneath. This side uh, where the mole hill is is where the mole pushes the soil up through so it can make more room to keep digging. And then it has a feeding runway. They are, um, they are something else to take or to see how they do. Hey, Gary, I don't think we got the first. Can you show the first uh, poll question? Yeah, I'm sorry. I noticed that because we had uh, because we had messed I messed with it so there you That's go. Right. Okay, do do moles eat your your garden vegetables? Yes or no? And just click on your answer and submit it. Oh, there we go. Sorry. Okay, so what'd you think on that? Let's see what we get. All right, the majority of the people said no, they don't. That is correct. Moles do not eat your vegetables. So what they what they do is they plow through your yard and basically they're eating the worms and the grubs and other stuff like that. We'll go back one slide, two slides actually. And if you look on the second bullet down there, they feed on grubs, earthworms, soil dwell and soil dwelling arthropods. So if you think your vegetable garden is getting destroyed by moles, it's not a mole. So it's usually some other uh, critter getting in there. So if you look down below on this mole run, there's also a nesting area down there. That's where they nest, and that's where they usually take the greens, the grass clippings and stuff like that so it stays nice and warm for their youngins to live down there. 
so the best thing I do with all my moles hills is I either take take a shovel out there, gather up the soil, put it into a bucket, and move it around the property. And what I'll do is I'll just scratch the top of it up real lightly, and I'll throw grass seed over top of it during the rainy season, and it'll just take and new grass comes up. I live with my moles. I don't try to trap them very often, and they're not really doing that much damage to my yard. They're just, you know, you just see them every now and then, and they go they go a little crazy on people's properties. If you see a surface ridge, just flatten these down with your feet, and then the run depressions, you just fill up with sand or dirt. So they're kind of easy to take care of. Okay, there's a lot of things that you can use to take care of these moles besides living with them. So there are scare tactics, which the vibrating stakes and the ultrasonic uh, devices, pinwheels, etc. But moles don't frighten easy. Usually if you put these static or these uh, ultrasonic devices in your property, they'll just go around them. However, over by my house, there's a guy's property he lives about a mile away from me. He doesn't have one mole in his, in his yard. And he lives next to, a, on one side, he lives next to a hay field. And on the next side, there's nothing but woods. But he has no moles at all on his property. So as I'm riding past this place, I keep looking and looking. And I notice, if you look on the top hand right of this uh, presentation, he's got these pinwheels posted on every or they're, they're set on every one of his posts, his main posts around his fence. So I went over and talked to him, and I asked him, I said, do you ever had moles in here? What's keeping them out? And he said ever since he put these pinwheels on and these things that vibrate the, the posts, he's never had a mole in his yard. But he's got probably 100 of these, uh, these uh, vibrating stakes or the pinwheels, or the things that spin on all of his poles going around his property. So he's got quite a collection. He doesn't have any problem with moles. Now, if you're going to try to take care of food reduction, that's going to be hard to accomplish because you can't. it's hard to get rid of all the worms and grubs. If you're doing raised beds, I recommend making sure you put down a, uh, a hardware cloth Usually about a quarter inch uh, wire will do great, and that'll stop them from coming up. And you can see this guy doing it in the fourth picture down there. He's doing it before he puts the soil over top of that bed. And then you got natural control predators like owls, hawks, and things like that. So your control. You can try flooding. That uh, When I called Washington Department of Wildlife, Fish and Wildlife, they said the best way that he's had luck with is taking a five-gallon bucket of water out there and then opening up the hole and dumping the, wa dumping the water down inside the hole, and it either drowns the mole or floods them out. They get discouraged, and they go someplace else. But that's only a temporary, temporary process. I have another neighbor that lives over here, and he's bound and determined he's going to take his, he's got a little vehicle, and he's got a dryer hose hooked up to it with duct tape, and he hooks it onto the muffler, and he tries to uh, gas him out. He it, It's failed every time, but he's very determined in trying to get this uh, mole gas out of his property, but it hasn't worked yet, so that one hasn't been too good. The... Uh, one off to the right there is the uh, sticks you put down. They're a gas stick. Haven't noticed those working too well. I think all it does is deter the moles temporarily, then they come back down. Uh, you can try shooting them. That's hard to do. You have to know where they're at to get them. Uh, trapping them is going to be your best method. And we're going to talk a little bit about the traps in the next uh, slide. Uh, they've got Tomcat Mole Killer. They're uh, uh, poison worms you put down in. But you have to be careful with those 
because if the mole eats them or if a dog or cat gets into them, that could cause hazards to your animals and children also. you got to keep clear of all that stuff. So not one of my favorite remedies. And they've got this thing called the mole cat, and it, it's like a percussion gun. And what you do is you dig the hole, you put this device in there, you load it. It's got a 22 caliber shell in there. It doesn't fire. It's like a blank, but it creates a percussion. And as the mole pushes on that target, he pulls the trigger, and the percussion kills him inside the hole. The only thing I found bad about those so far is they work great for a while. They're pricey. They're about $89 to $99 a piece. Um, after a while, the trigger mechanism sort of fails, and I'm not sure how well they're uh, warranted. But the best kind of trapping to do is the, the snap traps, and that's these bottom traps down here. If you want to dig the hole and get them opened up where you can put the trap down inside the hole. Measure 713, which was approved 7 November in 2000, that's almost 20 years ago, stated that you can't use lethal body gripping traps and they're not legal to use in the state of Washington. However, snap traps, such as the common mouse traps and rat traps, are legal. I don't understand how these are not body gripping traps because that's what they do. They grip the body. The castor oil based or other homemade repellents have not been proven very effective at all. So stay clear of those home remedies. Okay, moles are unclassified. There are no exceptions for emergencies about using uh, body gripping traps. You just can't use them. So I was trying to get clarification on these traps. So here's what a body gripping trap means. is any type of trap that grips an animal's body or body part. So any steel jawed leg hold traps, padded jaw leg hold traps, caught a bear traps, neck snares, non-strangling foot snares. Cage and box traps are legal and also the common mouse and rat traps are legal. So what I did was I ended up calling the legislature and I asked them what their determination, determination was of a body gripping trap. And the person in the legislature just told me that this initiative was put out for larger animals and it was supposed to be for fur traders, for fur trappers using them. And it was not it was to protect the domesticated animals from getting hurt. Well, that didn't go over too well. So then they just said, well, if you're using other type of traps, chances are nobody will do anything about it. So I didn't want to do anything like that. So I made another call. And this is when I found out about the Initiative 713 and went into great details on it, how it got initiated into the state of Washington. So my next step was I called... Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. And their response was, any device that grips a body part or body is considered a body gripping trap. And if you use these on moles, you'll be fined. So they were a little bit more clearer on their definition of this stuff. So we got the legislature that made the rule and then the, the WDFW that's following the rule. And they got two different determinations of the rule. So any questions on moles before we get into pocket gophers? Okay, good. Um, pocket gophers are, we're not going to talk very much about them because they're, they're usually up a little bit more north than down here. They're usually found on the Olympic Peninsula and around the southern Puget, Puget Sound area. And they're a little different than the, the uh, moles. You can see they're uh, eight inches in length, and their tail is usually about two and a half inches. Their tunnels are different. They don't have a, they got a run, but they don't have a feeding run.
trapping is basically about the same as you do for moles and you can go with a little bigger hard wire a half inch hard wire will work for hardware cloth gopher traps are legal but you can see smoke is usually ineffective and here's the legalities off the WDFW site so I'm not going to leave this up very long. You, we can go back to that site or you can look that up yourself. And if you're looking down at a mole mound and a pocket gopher the mound, there's the two differences. The mole mound is usually the hole is right in the center and the pocket gopher is usually off to the side. And here's some distinct differences between both of them. Here's another critter that gives us a lot of problems, voles. Voles are the ones that eat our vegetation. So you'll see these meadow, they're called meadow mice, voles. Um, they're the ones that are going to destroy your gardens. They're about six to nine inches long. They prefer the high grass and the brush so they can hide. And that's all they do is eat uh, your vegetables, herbivores. They'll destroy your root systems of your plants, and they got very, very, uh, when you look at the roots, when you eat them, they look like they've been through, run through a pencil sharpener. And they're active day or night. So ways to take care of them is keep your grass cut short, uh, pitfall traps, I don't know if you want to encourage hawks, owls, and coyotes and stuff like that on your property, but that's just what the WDFW says. You want to keep the vegetation clear around your tree trunks because it'll destroy a tree and set traps. If you're using raised bed, use the hardware cloth. And you want to make sure you do good cleanups. Make sure there's no bird feeders dumping seed on the ground. Get that cleaned up. Usually that's not a problem because usually the birds and the squirrels and the chipmunks take care of that for you pretty quick. And you want to make sure you get rid of all fallen fruit. Here's a sample of a pitfall trap. This is just a homemade one. They've got a pan of water at the bottom of the trap. They dug a hole. They put a coffee can up on top of it. And then they got two pieces of wire holding a spool where the vole goes down inside the hole and it drops into the water. Not very humane, but it's just an example of a pitfall trap for you. Okay, ground squirrels. Ground squirrels, we have five species in the state of Washington. Um, they're usually on the eastern side, so we'll stay clear of those a little bit. They generally go dormant, and they're herbivores also. Here's a way to prevent the squirrels from getting up into the trees is if they can't climb up the trees by putting a metal band around it, you can also put a, uh, a funnel type device on the bottom of the trunk or towards the bottom of the trunk and it'll prevent them from getting up into your trees. Tree squirrels. We have several different types in the state of Washington. The Douglas squirrel is the native. We have the western gray squirrels, the eastern fox squirrel on the east side, the northern flying squirrels, and this is just going to give you some basic information on the different types of squirrels. Lifespan of any small animal is usually about a year. Usually they get taken out by predatory animals. But if they live past that predatory stage, they live three to five years. Here's different ways to control. There's non-lethal methods. Uh, Non-native can be killed anytime. And just basically, if you want to live with them, protect your plants with wire cages and eliminate the problem so they can't eat them. The biggest thing on most of this stuff is eliminate the food source. Here's some more metal barriers for you. 
And there's the funnels again, the bands going around the tree, and here's a regular uh, box trap. Once again, repellents are not effective. And here's the legalities. The biggest thing about the legalities of anything, if you trap something, is you want to make sure if you trap it and the animal is still alive, you cannot remove it from the property. It has to stay on the property. So you can't take it down to your neighbor's property, drop it off on his property so he has the problem or they have the problem. You have to keep that trap animal on your property. Rabbits. Seven different species of rabbits and hares. They like eating our vegetables. They feed on the woody bark. They have six or more litters per year. I had a big problem with rabbits in my garden. Um, I have fencing around it, but my fencing is, uh, I got four inch square fencing. And the rabbits used to jump right through. So what I ended up doing was they were, they were always eating my, um, my green beans after I planted them and they take the leaf off and eat it right down to the ground. So all I did was I ended up putting PVC pipe in the ground around my green beans. And then I put fencing around about 18 inches tall and it prevented the rabbits from getting into my green beans and my peas and stuff like that. And they, they didn't bother them this year. And here's your different types of barriers. There's about the 30 to 36 inch fence high. I didn't go that high. I only went 18 inches and it was fine because it was in a raised bed already. So they didn't jump up onto the raised bed and then jump over the fence for me. So if you have cats and dogs, that'll keep the rabbits at bay. And rabbits and hares are protected by law. So you got to be careful shooting them. You cannot relocate them either. And here's the legalities off the WDFW site. A lot of problems with, uh, not so much out in the country, well, well, except for rats. I've seen some rats, but not very many. Um, mice, I have a lot of mice, but not too many rats. And the difference between, it's obvious the difference, the, the rats are a lot bigger. Uh, the droppings are bigger. The rats are brave. We were, I was out doing a, putting some drywall up for a friend. He lives up in Port Orchard and um, we were doing, uh, he lives in an old, um, like an old ranch style home. And it was like an old farmhouse. And we tore down the, the, um, the interior plaster. And as I'm doing this, I saw a rat walking across the, the studding and it came about three feet away from me and just looked at me and said, huh, and walked away, turned around and walked away. So these rats were inside his uh, walls of his house. So we ended up getting a, an exterminator in having them take care of the problem. But rats are d definitely a, a big problem if you, if you have an infestation of them. Here's some of the traps you can use. Uh, cats seem to work the one of the best. Uh, the traps. I notice these Victor traps. If you're not careful with the Victor traps, if the 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 vertebrae that you're trapping is bigger than the trap, they're going to walk away with your trap. So what I've been doing was, if I set traps like that, there's a little eye that's sitting right down by the bottom of the V. And I usually run some kind of uh, fishing line through that so they can't take my trap away and I don't have to go looking for it. So I tie it to something permanent and keeps it pretty safe from walking away. And the bottom on this, or the second one down is a bucket of water and they put a spool on a piece of wire and they put peanut butter on there and they uh, encourage the rodent to come across and it spins on that, that uh, spool and it drops into the water. That's kind of an inventive little trap. And there's poison and there's poison that are safe that cats and animals can't get into, which is on the lower left.
So whenever you're reading the poison or whenever you're looking at using poison, just make sure you read the instructions and find out if it's safe, you know, around animals, kids, and stuff like that. I, I kind of stay away from the poisons because of that factor right there. Are and here's some information on setting traps. For rats, you set one to two traps at least every 15 to 20 feet apart. And then mice go five to 10 feet apart. And that's just some recommendations. Art, can I make a comment? Sure, go ahead. Um, one of the things when we think about rats and different varmints, especially when it comes to poison, is sometimes they'll store the poisons. So just because the poison's in one spot doesn't mean they won't take it someplace else and store it for the winter or this or that. And that's what really is a double caution. Because you think you may have the poison away from your animals and your and your kids and things like that, and the rat will take it someplace else and store it, and then it's found. So um, I, I agree with with Art. You really got to be careful with poisons, and, and I'm just not a big fan. Yeah, you're Thanks, correct. Art. Yeah, there is a there is a story to go with that too. A friend, another friend of mine, he lives out in the country. He had mice, and he he put poison down. And he ended up, he opened up his dresser drawer one time and opened up to get a sweater out because it was, a, you know, coming into the winter months. And he found a lot of the poison back in the corner of his drawer. So, as Gary said, the the, the mouse had taken the, the poison and stored it for a later date. So, you want to definitely be careful of that. And that's a good point. Thanks for reminding me on that, Gary. And the old world rats or the Norway rats or whatever they want to be called, these are the ones that were brought over on the, uh, the old boats that came overseas from other countries, and they found a home here in the United States. So that's what they're talking about when you see old world rats. And they're unrestricted. You can kill them anytime you want. Okay, raccoons. Raccoons are uh, roughly about 50 pounds. They're nocturnal. They're very, very smart animals. They get into chicken coops a lot. They can open doors. They can take cans off garbage cans. They're, they're just incredibly smart. The biggest thing about the raccoons is the raccoon's feces contain the roundworm. So be very careful. They got to be careful around children if ingested, which I hope would never happen. But that's just something to know about. Barriers. Um, you can trap them. Uh, your fencing. Put an electric wire six inches off the ground. I think raccoons are so smart they open up doors to chicken coops. And they've got the. If you look at the type of uh, paw they have, they've got basically like a hand, like a fingers, that they can grab stuff and turn and do stuff with that hand, that paw. Here's the legalities of the raccoons. Possums, they're one of our only marasupals. 40 inches. And they weigh about 14 pounds. They like the they eat the insects, slugs, the big ones, snails, slugs. They like so. Alice loves these around our yard, I think. <laughs> but but I do not like them getting under the porches of the house. Um, they're solitary animals. They are they can they can bite, and they get, they can be quite vicious. Breeding time is early January to mid-November, and they can have five to ten pups 12 days after breeding. So they, they have babies very quickly. Cage traps, same as raccoons. You go back one. I thought I missed something. No? Okay. There's the legalities. Okay, skunks. Two types in the state of Washington. You got the 
striped skunk and the spotted skunk. Has, uh, if you can, I'm, Mike says, has anybody seen the spotted skunk around? I've only seen one around here in the state of Washington so far. But the striped skunks are the ones I usually see the most. They're, um, once again, they're night animals. They're scavengers. They get in, they eat uh, mice, rats, all small vertebrae, and they get into the eggs of the chickens. Lifespans, three to four years. Spotted is one and a half to two years. Okay, if you get sprayed with a skunk, if your animal gets sprayed with a skunk, here's a, a mixture that you can use to um, take the smell away. And the, um, it's, this is recommended by the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, one quart of fresh. 3% uh, hydrogen peroxide solution. If, and it says fresh, eventually hydrogen peroxide solution turns to water if it sits too long. One quarter cup of baking soda and one teaspoon of liquid soap. So you just mix this solution up and spray it on. Work it into a lather, leave it on for 30 minutes and it should break down the smell. And the best way to not to get uh, not get sprayed is don't get sprayed. Stay clear of them. Best way to keep any kind of these animals out is don't keep feed or keep your trash can lids closed. Make sure everything's bagged up tight. You want to make sure they can have access to denning sites and you want to make sure your ducks and chickens are safe at night. Once again, trapping. Once again, you can't remove an animal from the property. You have to put the animal, release it back on your property. So that's kind of defeating the purpose. And usually if you have a skunk, if you move it, Another one's just going to move in and come back in if it's uh, if it's if the habitat is uh, available or attractive to it. Here's the legalities for it. Not too many people have nutrient problems unless they live next to the water. And the uh, the biggest thing is on these is the ugly orange teeth. That's usually the easiest way to identify them. You can see them when they're swimming in the water. Those teeth just stand out like crazy. The bottom picture is a picture of their um, their home, their where they live, their den site, and a footprint off to the right. They do quite a bit of damages to your uh, banks, and they undermine the banks immensely. They feed on crops and can destroy your banks very quickly. The legalities of it, and that's once again is on the uh, Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. Mountain beavers, we don't have very many of those around here. They're usually in the coastal lowlands and mountains of western Washington, not so much here. And they're not really a beaver, but they actually look like they're actually in the squirrel family. They're vegetarians, and they just basically do damage to trees and plants. Another thing is they can die below a 50-degree temperature, so that's why they're not too, much, too common around here. Control is basically the same type, type as trapping. Uh, it says here about a 3-inch electrical wire above the ground. There's a picture of the print. And here's the legalities of it. Hey Gary, you want to bring in slide or the survey for number three? 
Okay, this survey is asking a question because beaver is the next topic. Can you remove a beaver dam without permission? And once again, just click the answer and submit. <laughs> Great answer. That's correct. You cannot remove the dam. Okay, beavers are our largest vertebrae. They can be three foot in length, and it takes a permit to remove a dam. They're very good engineers. They are great at building dams. They are great at building their dens, their lodge. They just do great things with uh, at constructing. Unfortunately, is usually if you get the dam, it usually causes flooding. Beavers do damages to a lot of trees, so you have to watch those. They eat the shrubs, the ferns, aquatic plants, grasses, crops. They are uh, they're 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 just a great engineer of all. I mean, they they make uh, dams. They stop the water from flowing. They are just unbelievable. Great swimmers. Okay, Gary, I think we're ready for the next survey also. Okay, what does a beaver use its tail for? Select all that are correct. And there could be more than one answer. So they can warn other beavers when frightened. They use it to pack mud when building, to support themselves when sitting on or standing, as a rudder when swimming, as a support when carrying, or it regulates their body heat. Go ahead and click what you think. Good variety of answers. All right, good. Okay, here's some information on telltales for the beaver. So it does act as a rudder. They do use it for a prop. They do use it to fright when they're frightened, they warn other beavers. They also use it for a counter counterbalance. And it does store fat for regulating the temperature. The one thing it doesn't do is Beavers do not use their tails to plaster mud on their dams. So that was just an old uh, wise tail. All right, control. When you have beaver damage, the best thing to do is to wrap the trees with a chicken wire or fencing. You can use a repellent, uh, homemade repellents with two-thirds of cup masonry sand and one quart of latex paint and paint the bottom of your trees. If you want a removal, you got to call WDFW. Here's the legalities. And deer is another big problem we have here. There are different types. We got the black tail and the white tail. The white tail are usually down by the lower Columbia River, and the black tails are usually west of the Cascades. And then you have a hybrid mix of uh, mule deer that's also on the west side of the mountains. East side of the mountains, you got the Rocky Mountain mule deer or the white-tailed deer eastern Washington. So there's deer all over the state of Washington. And they do a lot of damages. Okay, here's some interesting facts about fencing. When you want to put a fence up, the minimum amount of fence is usually six to seven feet is what they re recommend. However, if you use a, a double fence or a barrier, like when I do my fencing around my garden, 
I run my fence parallel to my raised beds, so they they get confused when they look inside that they won't either they won't they'll either jump high or they'll jump long, but they won't do both. So they won't try to land in the middle of something. So that's usually the secret about deer. They eat a usually when they say it's deer resistant. Well, it might be deer resistant for a while, but if they get hungry, they're going to eat it. They they are ruminant. They have four stomachs. And the big thing is, is you want to make sure you fence your plants in so the deer don't get to them. They shed their antlers once a year. Okay, preventing conflicts, you fence them, you barriers, landscaping with deer resistant plants, cattle guards, dogs, repellents, motion sensor detectors. Yeah, if you see, um, I don't know why I don't get I don't get a lot of deer around the house anymore. I've got lights that come on with motion. That usually scares them off till they get used to it. Uh, I've never used repellents. I have dogs. I had dogs. Uh, I've never tried cattle guards, but I do use fencing. And my fencing is only five foot tall, but they don't usually jump it because, like I said, they won't jump the length, the the distance, and the height. So I've got them kind of confused on that. So, so far, they haven't hit my garden very much. Uh, this repellent here is from the WDFW. Um, this web, this PowerPoint presentation is in the chat box also. So if you go into the chat box when we're all done with the presentation, copy that link, and it will bring you right to this whole PowerPoint presentation. And you'll be able to see it anytime you want to look at look something up. And it gives you all the hyperlinks for the sites I used for this information. Here's the legalities on the deer. Elk. Uh, some people have a lot of problem with elk. Some people don't. The Roosevelt elk is usually on the west side of the mountains, and the Rocky Mountain elk is usually on the east side of the mountains. The barriers on for elk are a little higher than the uh, deer, so you want to go eight to nine feet. They have an excellent sense of smell and can run up to 35 miles an hour. They're fast animals. They are grazers. The biggest thing I noticed about deer and elk that They'll destroy the plant, and they'll just take a little. They're lazy animals. They'll just take a little bit and leave the rest. So they'll take a bite out of something and go to on and destroy some more of the plant and then just move on to another plant, and they'll get your whole group of plants without even thinking about, you know, anything about it. My um, One of my friends here had, they, they just moved into their house, and they went, um, they were sleeping, and they woke up in the middle of the night, and they heard this noise. So they walked outside, and there was a whole herd of elks in their yard. And they just planted their grass, their yard. So the wife got, she was upset about seeing all the elk in there, so she decided she was going to go out and scare them. So she went in the garage, opened up the garage door, and laid on the horn of her car. And that was the biggest mistake she ever did. There was about 20 to 30 elk on our property, and they all scattered, and they just left ruts uh, in her property. She was so mad when she come up the next morning and saw all the ruts in her property from scaring the elk. So you gotta be, if you're, if you're trying to get rid of the elk, they're heavy, and they can, when they're at a full run, they can cause a lot of damage. Their hooves will dig right in. It's basically the same things for uh, preventing fencing, barriers, cattle guards, dogs, repellents, motion sensor lights. A little bit about the antlers. They shed their antlers beginning in late February and then late April for the younger ones. The bigger ones are in late Feb February, the younger ones, April.
All right, Gary, you can put up the last one too. Last survey question. All right, do bats catch food in their wings? Yes or no? Uh, undecisive, some yeses and some noes. Good, good. All right. There's more than 15 species of bats in the state of Washington. Uh, they're very beneficial. They keep the mosquito count down. They are night feeders on insects. And this next, there's going to be a picture. And yes, bats do catch insects in their wings. They'll fly by, they'll catch the insect in the wing, and then they'll eat it. They're our own, only true flying mammal. They are not blind at all, and they don't get entangled in your hair. So those are a lot of myths. They can be rabid, and they live approximately 30 years, so they live for a long time. But they are, they are very, very beneficial for getting rid of uh, uh, insects and their their uh, bat guana is some of the best fertilizer used is if you have bat boxes and collect the bat guana uh, at the bottom of the bat box, that's some of the best fertilizer you can use on your plants. So a little bit about bat houses. And once again, this uh, PowerPoint is listed in the chat box. So copy it and then save it and go back on it. And this is going to tell you, a little bit about bat boxes, how clear they have to be for a runway. Usually they want to clear of obstructions for about 20 feet and you want to put the house about 12 feet, 15 to 20 feet in the air is optimum. And you want to keep it on the sunny side of the, uh, the whatever you're mounting it to so they stay nice and warm. And I'm going to, uh, next slide is going to show you some uh, places to get plans for bat houses. And if you look at these houses, you see model one, model two, model three, different models here. And some have multi-chambers and some have single chambers. The theory behind it is the single chambers are for the males because they like to be by themselves. And the multi-chambers are for the females and all the kids. So the babies all stay in the multi-chamber and the, and the females, and then the males usually dwell in the uh, single-chamber houses. But that's the theory behind them. And these are some great sites if you want to get the schedule or the uh, plans for these boxes. Preventing conflicts in the house. That's usually your biggest conflict is getting them in the house. You just got to make sure that there's no openings they can squeeze through. Make sure your vent covers are intact. Make sure your windows are no holes. Make sure around your chimneys are secure. They can't get down your chimneys. And just make sure they don't have holes where they can squeeze through. Legalities. Once again, the Department of uh, Fish and Wildlife. And bird problems, crows, robins, flickers. My my big one this year was the flickers. I had a um, one that was just being a pest. He kept pecking on my house. And we just painted the house last year, so I was kind of upset I was getting them this year. So what I did with the flicker was I ended up using a uh, fishing line, and I put a thumbtack in on the trim board and I ran the fishing line all the way across about four inches above where the flicker was perching and I put a uh, ribbon on the on the uh, fishing line and lo and behold I didn't think it was going to work but it did and I got that off the WDFW site too and then next year what I'm going to end up doing is I'm going to build a flicker house 
And what that does is you put this house out in the property, the flicker, you fill it up with sawdust, and the flicker thinks that he's pecking on a, a wooden object, and he'll dig it out, and he'll make it into his nest. So I'm going to try that next year so I don't have to keep the fishing line out. But birds are a problem. They get your, your crops. They eat your berries. And usually if you have cherries out there, the birds will get the cherries before you do. So the best thing to do is either net your trees if you can, uh, put scare tactics will work on the birds a little better than the other vertebrae pests. But uh, I found out the scare tactics work very well. Um, if you look at the second picture in the middle on the left-hand side, you see the uh, bird pecking a, a sort of symmetrical holes around the tree. That is not causing damage. All they're doing is uh, going after insects or sap inside the tree bark. So it doesn't hurt the tree at all. Controlled netting scarecrows, reflective strips, aluminum pie pans, noise will work, motion, anything that moves, it all works great. Dogs and cats getting into the garden. Uh, they basically the damages they do in there is they usually can mess in the garden. That's something you don't want in there. You don't want the feces to get into your uh, vegetable garden. Um, you don't want the dogs digging or causing problems in the garden like that. I I keep my animals out of my garden area, and so far I haven't had any trouble with cats or dogs, but. You can see a sprinkler system works on the cat there, gets the cat away from the garden if you don't want the cat in there. Usually they stay clear unless they really, really got something in there that they want to get after. And the hardest vertebrae pest to control are the kids. And everybody else that wants the fruit off the trees and everything they can get their hands on. So the usually the limit for fencing is usually six foot high fence in the city. In the city, you want to build it as high as the legal legalities can get you. And the best thing to do is plant, plant like pears and figs in the front yard, apples and blueberries in the backyard, so they're not so desirable. But that's it for vertebrae. Any questions?